and welcome to this week's edition of 50 Years Serving the Island, a series of programmes showcasing highlights from Manx Radio's archives during the station's first five decades serving the public in the Isle of Man. In 1968, Manx Radio was transferred into public ownership and became the island's public service broadcaster. Today, we hear the first part of entertainer Lawrence Kermode recounting his memories of early life to David Callister on Time to Remember in a conversation recorded in 2001. So, Edward Lawrence Kermode, born on the 1st of April 1915, and still a young man. (laughs) In heart. Lawrence, we've been talking a little bit about your early days, and I've, I've been enjoying this, but really we're confusing the Isle of Man with Liverpool in your very earliest days when you were very young, aren't we? Yes, yes, yes. I, uh, I was born in the Isle of Man in, in Castletown, 62 Malou Street, actually. It was a baker's. My grandparents lived there, my maternal grandparents, my mother's grandfather and grandmother, my earliest recollections of anything were in Liverpool, but I must have been three or four then, but I remember being in the very earliest days, but I've been thinking it over since. I wondered how I got to Liverpool, and I thought that I was taken there when I was a a baby, Mm. after I was born. But on reflection, I think that it's possible that my parents were already living in Liverpool at the beginning of the First World War, 1914, and that my mother had come home to her parents yeah. to have me. Yes. Uh, uh, so you'd be uh, born Manx? Yes, it, yes. Yeah. that I was born in, in, at, her gra- at her mother's house, yes, yes. in Castletown. But so, you're telling me you remember things from when you were three or four, then? Well, it must have been. I, I, my very, very earliest recollections is being taken out into the street in Liverpool and to look up into the sky and to see a zeppelin <laughs> passing over. So that must have been during or towards the end of the First World War. That's right. Also, during the, the, the war, it, it, or it must have been the end of the war, mm. I also have vivid memories of a man who was demobbed, obviously, and he must have been a neighbour, friend or something, I don't know who he was, but he had uh, his his handcart with all his gear on out in the street outside of our house. And on that, amongst his gear, there was his rifle and his tin hat. And me, being a little boy, I wanted the gun, of course, (laughs) naturally, you see. But I didn't get the gun, but he did give me the tin hat. And Mm. I had that tin hat for many, many years. As a matter of fact, when eventually when we came back again to the Isle of Man, I was in a little bit of a gang and uh, the initiation <laughs> ceremony, I'm laughing to think about it, the initiation ceremony, you had to wear this tin hat yeah. and, and the other one of the leader hit us on the head with it three times, but we only had to bang on the head. Yeah. Well, I tell you, it was <laughs> but that was, uh, he must have been friendly, but I remembered the uh, the tin hat and the guns and all that. What sort of memories do you have of your mother and father? Indeed, grandparents, do you remember grandparents? Oh, grandparents, well, my maternal grandparents, I do remember, but not my paternal grandparents, no, no, no. who were the most famous, or the one of them anyway, was the most famous, but we talk about him. Yes, my uh, mother's father and her mother, my grandfather was the baker for his son, actually. He'd been in business himself and he'd failed. I'm afraid he was too fond of the the emulsion, (laughs) the liquor. (laughs) And uh, he had failed because he'd had his own business in Port Erin at one time. Mm. And then his eldest son, one of his eldest and one of my mother's older brothers, was R.W. Holmes. And they had, he had, his son, had three premises in Castletown. One was what we call the shop where the fancy cakes were made, where he did those himself, Uncle Bob. There was a place midway down Malou Street, which we call the stores, and in there, the buns and the minced meat pies and all that sort of thing, they were made there, what they call the smalls. And in 62 Malou Street, where I was born and my grandfather worked, that was where he made the bread. So you see, they had Malou Street, the bread, 
halfway down they had the the buns yeah. and then in the shop uh, behind the shop there was another bakehouse yeah. where they made the cakes yeah. and he also had uncle bob he also had a big cafe in port Ern, oh, right. yeah. which is now falcon's nest oh yes Falcon's yeah. Nest with that great big room there. That was a big restaurant he had oh, there. Yeah, he had all right. these things. Mm. Yeah, that that was Mother's side. But you see, when we were in, I would just, if I could refer back to Liverpool there, it was interesting because I, these are early memories. You see, my memories are of early days, really. Yeah. There used to be gospel meetings, like, you know, uh, what's the present day man... Uh, comes over from America. There's oh, a lot yes. Of them, but, you know, Dr. Billy Graham. Billy Graham. Well, there was there was a great thing in, in Liverpool, in, in England in those days. I suppose they were, well, I don't know what they were trying to do, but they convert everybody. But I remember being in one of these and also going to a big taken to see a, a circus, which was in another place. Now then, I don't know whether it was coming home from the circus or coming home from this gospel meeting, but at the circus, I do remember the usual thing. I've seen it and heard of it since, but I do remember seeing it there, the big white horse telling the time by pawing the ground. <laughs> you know, it's an old <laughs> yeah. trick, you know. Yeah. I know of since I've been in the theatrical line myself but on the way home of one of either of those two events the heavens opened it was torrential rain the, the streets were flooded and we were, it was all tram car travel mm. and um, my cousin who Nellie Holmes she was who lived with us she was the daughter of one of my mother's brothers you see Mother had two brothers living with us there in, in Liverpool during the war. Yeah. She was an orphan, that's why she lived with us. Not a, she had a father, but he lived with us. But their mother had died with the flu epidemic or something like that. Mm. I don't know what it was. But she died. And she had a red coat. And all this torrential rain, the red coat died. The dye in the red coat died completely. Dropped out of it. It's all dropped. She was dripping red. Uh, Nellie was with the with the dye coming out of her coat. That was that coming home there from the your your early education at uh, in Liverpool. But of course. Um, you went to St Thomas's School in, in Douglas as well. I you? did indeed, yes. Um, in fact, St Thomas's School was the only school that I, that's my education, I started, I didn't, well, I started when I came back to the Isle of Man, and apparently it was in 1921, I think I've got it somewhere written down. I did make a point of going to the school, and uh, John Riley, the present uh, headmaster there, brought out the register and there it was. We were, the three of us, my two sisters, elder sisters. I was the youngest. There was, Rini was my elder sister. Mm. She was born in Balasala. Edna, the middle sister, was born in Douglas and I was born in Castletown. Because they moved around a bit, my father and mother. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But anyway, I went to St. Thomas's School, we, we all went to St. Thomas's School, and recently I was invited to talk to the children there to tell them about what things were like in those days. Well, I got a bit of a surprise to find out. In my day, there was just the one big room. Mm. It was just right up to the rafters. Yeah. Well, now, of course, there are two floors there. Well, there weren't two floors. The room was divided by a curtain, yeah. there were two classes at the top end mm. and one class at the bottom, the two classes at the bottom. And there was one little other room, which uh, the infants, that's where I started in oh, there, yeah. because yeah. I must have been, well, 21, I'd be six years of age, so was that 25? Yes, that's yeah. eight, 15, 20, yeah. yeah. That's right, I'd be six. Yeah. So it was in there, there was, and then you had standards three and four, two, three, and four, I suppose, I don't know, but the one teacher had this, Miss Stewardson, she was the teacher, mm. who took the, the other side of the, the curtain, or when I was in it, partly time too. Yeah. And there was only the one big coke stove, that mm. was all the heating there was. Yeah. And we sat in long forms, five or six to a form, in fact, just a seat, was, did they have a back on all the back? There was just the, the, the seat, yeah. and um, There'd be the desk was attached to the seat. Oh, attached to it, yes. Yeah, but there mm. were five or six of you in the one. Oh, right. And the inkwell in, you know, yes. within that. And I remember the great excitement when they had the new two-to-a-seat 
forms, you know, oh, yes, which are which right. old hat now. Nowadays, they sit around tables and yes. all, all manner of things. So you'd be five or six in a row when you were there? Then. Oh, at first, yes, yeah. yes, yes, you were. Uh, the toilets were outside and they were in the open air. Mm. They're covered in now with a small extension that's been built over the infant's room. Yes. Uh, we, uh, I was there from the age of... I left school when I was 14 because we did in those days. Mm. There were many scholars there at, at St Thomas's School who became successful in their chosen careers. There were all sorts of people, you know, have gone through St Thomas's the only education, you might say, really, was when from up to 14 years yeah, of age. Yeah. Then you left school. And you could pretty, go to night school. Yeah, it would be basic education. Oh, basic what? education. Yeah. Absolutely basic, yes. R reading, writing, arithmetic are the three That's things. That's right. Person, and, Composition. And, yeah. and uh, the teacher might draw an apple or something. That was the art lesson. <laughs> that was the only art lesson you ever got. Yeah. And as for geometry and algebra and all... And, and la languages and, out the country. And languages were literally foreign languages to yeah, us. Yeah. Double Dutch as far as we knew. <laughs> we never had anything at all no. in that regard. No. We had. You le I learned far more after I'd learned school because as I say, and another thing you see, when I left school, I went to work. I took it upon myself actually. There were two of us who were 14 years, coming up to 14, ready mm. to leave school. Mm. Edwin Crellen, whom I knew later, in, later on in the musical world. Edwin and myself. Now, the then headmaster, his name was George Kennel, and he lived at the bottom of Summer Hill. Now then, in those days, the tram cars ran summer and winter. Oh, right. And he came in, and another man, who was a printer, whose name was Marshall Brideson, who was eventually to be one of the founders of Brideson Horrocks. Marshall Brideson came in with... George Kennel every day on the horse car mm. and he said one day to George Kennel you got any likely lads that you know for an apprenticeship so he said oh I'll see so he said to Edwin and myself you know either of you interested well Edwin wasn't because Edwin was more inclined to he was more academic I suppose than me <laughs> I want to do something with me hands you see yeah. and so he said well there's this job going with Louis Meyer as a printer mm. Louis G Meyer 19 Duke Street it was. So I went myself off my own, but I didn't go home to ask my parents anything like that. I knew that I had a, you know, I was coming up from leave school, you want to get a job. Yeah. So I went and I saw Mr. Meyer. That was it. I was taken on. Yeah. Well, of course, those days it was five and a half day a week. But mm. what I was going to mention was we left school in short trousers. Mm. And I went to work in short trousers. <laughs> really? Oh, yes. Yeah. And uh, eventually, I, a pair of trousers, I think my mother, they were cut down. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't admit it, you know, but there no. were me, a pair of my father's trousers cut down for me because one of the fellas in the works with us, he used to call me tragedy trousers, you know. <laughs> and I, 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 you know, he said, the old man's trousers, you went, Lawrence. I said, no, they're not, you know, of course they were, but I wouldn't admit it, you see. They were. <laughs> You're listening to 50 Years Serving the Island, a series showcasing highlights from the Manx Radio archives from the station's first five decades as the Isle of Man's public service broadcaster. Today, entertainer Lawrence Kermode shares some of his early memories of life growing up in Liverpool and the Isle of Man with David Callister in a conversation recorded in 2001. Would you get paid as an apprentice? Because a lot. Oh of yes, yes, it was a good yeah. yes, ten shillings a week. All right, which was very good because mm. printers were were amongst the trades. They were very well paid. Yeah, some apprentices. In other trades, only got five shillings a week. So when you got home and told your parents you got the job, oh, yes, then I said, I'm starting. They'd be and delighted said, with it. And yes, and I said, uh, I need uh, a black apron. They said to tell your mother to get an apron. So over the weekend, she had to make a black apron. It mm. would be black stuff. I don't know what they like. They used to use for blackouts and that sort of thing. But it was a black apron. Yeah. And she made the apron for me. And then I started down in the cellar. And what were you doing, first of all? 
apprentice printer. Oh, what I, did that mean in those days? I mean, learning the trade of printing. But I mean, getting to getting oh, to yeah, use oh, all the all type. <laughs> well, I started off in down below. Oh, I did. I mentioned uh, Marshall Brides and travelling. Well, it was him that was. He was the machine room foreman oh, yeah. in Louis Myers. You see. Ah, oh, right. So I was there. Now, if you go down, it's a hairdressers now at the end of King Street on to, on the corner of. Uh, the front of the shop is now animal feed stuffs and mm. not animals, uh, pet stuff. Uh, yes, yeah. But at the back side of it, where we used to go into work, there is um, uh, ladies' hairdressers. But uh-huh. if you look down on the level with the pavement, you'll yeah. see an un- uh, room down there. A cellar, well, yeah. That's where we started. You wouldn't yeah. be allowed to work there now. Uh-huh. But we worked in the cellar. Mm. And one of the most interesting things is this. When I first started to work there, one of my jobs, the very first job, was to stand behind a great big machine to guide the sheets of printed matter that were coming off. Right. And there were great big sheets, and it was a book, and the book that was being printed was the second edition, or the second running, of Sophia Morrison's Manx Fairy Tales. Oh, really? And uh, the cover was an octavo sheet, now the cover was a, a linen piece and that was printed on a machine and that with colourless ink and then he put them to one side and then they had to be dusted with gold dust. Oh, yeah. It was it was what we call bronzing powder. Yeah. There was silver, which we use for, for wedding cards mm. and there was bronze, I don't know what you use that for, and the gold yes. were, were not very often it wasn't real gold, I suppose, but anyway, it was very. That's another thing you wouldn't be allowed to do because I was stood there with these sheets, with these covers of the book coming off the machine in this colourless ink, and I had to dip a piece of cotton wool into this thing, which you get up your nose and all sorts of yeah. things, and dust them, and it stuck to the thing. Yeah. You see, then you had to dust them off afterwards with another yeah. piece, a clean piece, and uh, then of course they were sent up to the bookbinders, and they were part of the cover that formed the thing. It has since been reproduced in a different, in the modern format of, yes. uh, you there to sell them up in the museum. But that's a, that's a great piece of Manx history, uh, oh, being yeah, there to, yes. to, to, I to in, publish it. I, I was there watching the big sheets come off, and then yeah. I was also involved with, as an apprentice, just stand there. But you see, Louis Meyer, Louis G. Meyer, Unfortunately, he went bankrupt after I'd been there two and a half years, I think. Uh. Fourteen, yes, that's right. Now then, this is the foundation of Brideson and Horrocks started there because there was Marshall Brideson as the machine room foreman. Harry Horrocks was a senior apprentice who was 19 Mm. when they they folded up. I was the junior apprentice. I'd be 16 and a half by that time, two and a half years from 14, you see. Well, of course, I didn't have any money or anything like that. But Horrocks and uh, Marshall Brideson, Mr. Brideson, of course he was to me, and Harry Horrocks, uh, they started up in Market Street. And I had no work. I was out of work. I nearly went to work for Sam Norris. But he was seeing me, and there was a, some business about the unions, whether I was... Uh, to, whether there was the quota. Yeah, there was a quota in those days. There only so many apprentices to tradesmen you see mm. and there must have been some hold up but I do remember that I was down in Noble's Baths on a Friday afternoon we always used to go on a Friday from school you see and yeah. I kept it up afterwards from, mm. and I was down there swimming in there and I remember Harry Horrocks came in because they told him that's he'd been looking for me because they wanted to see if I was coming to work. he said what are you going to do Lawrence I, I was in the ba- in the water and he's talking to me, leaning down. He said, yeah. what are you going to do, Lawrence? Are you coming with us or are you going with Sammy Norris? I said, I'll come with you. Yeah. Because I said, yeah, I'm being messed about. Mm. I said, when do I start? He said, tomorrow. Well, it was Saturday. Well, of course, in those days, you worked you five worked? and a half yes. a week. Yes. And that was in 1931, you see. Mm. So that was this, the beginning of... Brides and Horrocks. And you, you stayed with Brides and Horrocks as a printer, as a printer. virtually three whole careers? No, no, you know? no, half of my... Ah. <laughs> I've, been in, I've been in printing all my life. Yes, I thought you had. But uh, 26 years I did with <laughs> with Brides and Horrocks or so, and I did another 26. 
with the Examiner and Times, oh, or the Times yes. and Examiner. Yes. yes. And Hopper Collister, I worked with the Nelson Press for a while too, mm. with Hopper when I left uh, Brides and Horrocks. Well, did printing change very much as oh, you... Oh, it hadn't changed since Caxton's day. No. No, it hadn't until the linotype came into being. And then that was the biggest change. Now, uh, what was linotype? What was that? A linotype is a machine with a keyboard on it mm, yeah. that the printer sat down, he tapped the thing, and there were little brass matrices yes. which formed up in a line. They, were, they came down a chute from the back. Ah. They were all, all up at the back of this big machine. You'll yes. see one down Peel Road where they are now. They don't use them now, no, of course. No. But all these little mats they used to call matrices, they were mm -hmm. brass matrices, they came down. You know a key design? Yes. Where they're all different, key, different letters had a different key design because when they went up, they'd fall down into their different boxes, yeah, you right, see. Right. All the letters of the alphabet and yes. the figures. So when the operator tapped a key, one of these things, mats would come down and form up in a little piece, a holder in front of them, and then he would stop it and he'd look at it to see, he could read the letters yes. and read what it said. He had a handle there, he lifted it up and that w took, went, took, into position, went right? away into yeah. the, um, into, it was a big yeah. molten metal right. and that was forced into these things which formed what we used to call a slug. Yes, right. Well, they, they were, I didn't, yeah. We never talk about them garden slugs, there no. was a slug of metal. Type high, that's another thing, type high was the same height as a shilling in yes. the old, if you put it on end, that was type high. Mm -hmm. That's 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 a pound coin. Yeah. But it was type high was 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 uh, that certain height you yes. see it had to be. That was when you had a liner type. But previously to that, if that was after the liner type was yeah. invented, well before that, every and what I did. Um, was taught, uh, you know, right through, was hand set. Yeah, Everything yes. was hand, hand set, set yeah. in, in what you call a setting stick. Mm. And you picked the letters out of the case. Yeah. And it was upper and lower case. So when linotype came along then, it was a revolution almost, was it? Well, it was. There were, I mean, linotypes had been in for some considerable time. But it mean, yeah. I mean, in my younger days, they'd only been invented may, maybe a hundred years before, which wasn't, mm. it's only a flick of the eyelid because hand setting, printing hadn't altered since Caxton yeah. and Wink and D Word and all these right. other guys, you know. So I, what was the difference? I mean, after you'd done, after you'd done the linotype setting, Ah, uh, uh, well, the linotype was, uh, did I mention that, it was, it was hand done. I told you all about the matrices and yeah. then come down. But hand setting, you had to pick every letter out yes. of what we called a case, which was put up on the stand. Mm. And uh, there was the one that was in front of you uh, was the lower case, which was all the small letters, and up above that was all the capital letters. Yeah. And you had to pick out every letter of every word singly, That's right. put it into a setting stick. But didn't you have to put it back to front as well? Well, it was it was all it is back from, but you can read it. But actually, it's upside down. Upside down, was it? Yes. Well, you. But it was upside down. But it wasn't like that upside down. It was like as in a mirror. As in a mirror. Yes. yes. So we we could read that yes. just the same as anybody could read ordinary. You know, straightforward. Yes. I don't know why, but it came naturally to you. But to then you'd have to put all those letters back to where they all came. All those letters after it had been printed, it had to be what we call dist, which was an abbreviation of the word distribution, mm. the, all the type had to be distributed back into the cases into because they all yeah. had to be used again. Yeah. Now those letters were a lot stronger type than the liner type mm. because the liner type was, the metal was a softer mm. metal. Mm. Now when the liner type, which produced these slugs of metal, yeah. they were all stuck together, you see, the liner type slugs, they were all, the letters were all in one row yeah. and stuck together with the line. Now afterwards they were just tossed aside, dumped into another big uh, melting pot, not on the liner type, they no. were melted separately, separately into big yeah. ingots, you see, yeah. in another melting thing. While you were doing this then, presumably you got into the artistic side of life and to, into painting, which we'll talk about, and, and particularly into singing, didn't you? Yeah, yes, yes, I, I got into singing because for good or evil, I was a natural, I had a natural voice. I often say to people, if, I, if there's anything that I've got, any talent at all, it's in my voice. And um, I knew that times were changing, you see. I'd always been interested in singing, you know, dance bands. I've sung on in the uh, 
for the pallidy dance and uh, I've sung in all sorts of things like that, you know. But yeah. I realised that when I was being asked to sing at functions and in uh, like in Masonic meetings and things like that, I needed to have a bit of a repertoire, you see, of, mm. of straight stuff. You couldn't yeah. get up and sing the, the usual... Uh, sort of pop stuff. Pop yeah. stuff. No, yeah. you had to have something. So I uh, said to Harry Pickard, I was friendly with Harry, and I said, could you give me a few lessons, Harry? He said, aye, aye. He said, yes, yeah, certainly. He said, I'll, I'll help you, you'll help me. So at that time, he was the um, choir master of uh, St Ninian's mm. Church. Oh, yeah, yeah. So he said, will you come and sing? Well, I'd been brought up a Methodist, mm. but I was married in the, in the church. I was married in the old All Saints Church, and don't you say tin tab, my wife would turn in a grave, <laughs> and she, she was a, belonged to there, and she yeah. hated people saying the, the tin, tin tab. tab. Yeah. It was All Saints Church to her. Anyway, so I said, aye, OK. I said, but I don't know the, the church. Oh, he said, you soon learn it. So he gave me lessons, you know, and I went to sing and, and I was in the church choir there. And uh, he said, uh, well, do you want to go in for this uh, properly, you know, enter the guild and that sort of thing? I said, yes, uh, why not? So he said, OK. So he put me in for the open tenor. I was a tenor, you see, open tenor class. And the first time I was in, I won the first first, first, prize. first time, yes, yeah. first prize, yes. Really? Now, it was... It was very, very flattering, really. But at the same time, it wasn't because I was immediately catapulted into what we call the special class. I am now what you might call a special tenor, mm. amongst the special tenor class, you see. Mm. And because of that, I was then, where with the open tenor, you just had to sing one song, but with the special, you had to sing two they were a lot harder songs you sang. Although the song that I won with, the, the open tenor solo, has since been used in the special class. Mm. It was Our Moon of My Delight, which was oh, yes. based on Omar Khayyam. Mm. Our Moon of My Delight that knows no way. And it was, it was a, you know, a beautiful song, but it was a difficult song to sing. But I was lucky, and as I say, I won. That's all there's to it. Yeah. So did you keep on entering? Uh, and the, then, um, the yes, and I, I, I often say to people, I start at the top and work my way to the bottom. <laughs> be because the best I ever did in the special tenor was to tie for second place. Yeah. But I did, and uh, that was, oh, it was, yes, it was singing Aida. Uh, it was a beautiful, that's a beautiful thing. It's right at the beginning of, of the opera, Aida. What, what titles did you enjoy singing? What songs did you like most in, that you sort of <laughs> permanently put in your repertoire? You know? Well... In those days, of course, I used to sing, and I sang what was the usual middle-of-the-road stuff. But if you're talking to me about what my musical tastes are, mm. I have very Catholic tastes, actually. And I've said this previously, because I like the top of the sandwich and the bottom, but I don't care for the middle bit. <laughs> I'm not too fussy about the... Um, <clears throat> What do they call them? Musical comedy, uh, mm. the choral union type of oh, stuff. Yeah, you know right. that 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 yeah. kind of thing. I'm not too keen on that. I like the grand operas and the beautiful arias. I like that, and I like the bottom. And I love give you the bus fare to Lexi, oh, for instance. Well, that's that's uh, that's an that's a different <laughs> sphere on its own. Yeah. I enjoyed that when I was singing, but I yeah. realise, of course, it's it's all very shallow stuff, really. <laughs> but very very enjoyable, and a lot of people must have, we must have given a lot of enjoyment to a lot of people when we, because there's still people asking for give me the bus fare to Lexi and all this <laughs> carry on and all the. You know, the Laxie girls and the boys and, oh gosh, I don't know, all these <laughs> Stuart Slack songs we sang, but yeah. we sang all that. Entertainer Lawrence Kermode sharing his memories with David Callister on Time to Remember in a conversation recorded in 2001. And we'll have more from that conversation on the programme next week. And you can listen back to that programme along with additional content from the Manx Radio archives online at manxradio.com forward slash portal. Yeah.